Welcome, <laughs> David. <laughs> I know, it's all my fault. I, uh, <laughs> I forgot about the video. <laughs> I'm sorry, David. Welcome, Paul. Merci. Hey, guys. How are you? Awake? Good morning. Hello, David. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Good, thank you. So, advertising. And you, 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 you write this book about how business is good, and you're a madman. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, obviously when I wrote the book, I thought, you know, people are going to say, but hang on, your, didn't your industry create the problem? Aren't you the people who made people buy things they didn't want? And so my sort of response to that was, first of all, if you think we created the problem, then you have to believe we can fix it as well. But I think the really important point is that what's happening is, you know, our whole industry is moving from an industry that was all about image to an industry that has to be all about reality. And I think it's one of the biggest shifts we're seeing, you know, because today the whole subject of, of these three days about what technology is doing, technology has fundamentally empowered any individual to create a mass movement against any leader or business that doesn't behave in the way they want it to. And I think that's forcing the world of business to be much more socially responsible. But, do, but up, to, up to now, basically, what we're talking about social responsibility in, in companies, it was about changing a logo and hiring a few people and make some you know, donation to charities. So how has this shift, how is, has social media has anything to do with it? I, I mean, you know, for me, social media is the thing. I mean, social media is the number one driver. I mean, it's created this world of radical transparency. People now can find out anything about a company or a leader. They can share that with everybody live in real time. And you literally, I mean, every single week, you know, you just look at the last four weeks, you had Mitt Romney, 47%, basically saying that sort of 47% of Americans don't pay tax. They're sponging off society. He's doing it at a private dinner to 200 rich people. What happens, someone films it, posts it. It was one of the moments that changed the election. You know, look at American Apparel and Gap through Hurricane Sandy, who start pushing messages out saying, if you're trapped inside, isn't this a great time to come shopping at Gap.com? Obviously, exactly. people didn't think it really was a good idea to try and exploit a massive catastrophe where people are dying, and they got hammered in social media. Or the flip side of it, I mean, I, you know, I think if you kind of want to take a step back and understand how fast the world has changed, the fact that the British Prime Minister would take a picture of himself phoning the American president to congratulate him on being elected, have that picture taken and post it on Facebook. If you just said someone 10 years ago, some, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of Britain would congratulate the president of America but and post it. Isn't that just like PR, that last move? No, but I think you know, the Pope announced this week he's going on Twitter, has 500,000 followers already. Yeah, I mean, I, in a, I, I, in two days. I yeah. think it's showing that people understand that the world has, has dramatically changed. And I think for the world of business, you, know, you see every single month another victim of what I call the, the so, age of damage. So yeah, exactly, the age of damage. Basically, they're learning by failure, is every time they fail, they actually learn. This is the, this, you use the term force, they're forced to change. So mo most of the examples you just mentioned, especially for businesses, are basically failures. But I mean, good and bad. I mean, I think if you look at failures you know, or, or whether, I wouldn't call it failure, I would call it people holding businesses accountable. So look at news of the world in the UK, the newspaper, part of the hacking scandal, a whole movement grew up on Twitter to say advertisers don't spend money on news of the world, the news of the world closed. But there's lots of people who are also understanding how this is a good thing. You know, I think if you look at Patagonia, who, who ran a very famous campaign Dang last it. year, which was don't buy this jacket, they created a channel with eBay to sell secondhand yes. Patagonia clothing. Um, you know, people are going to hang on, but they're saying don't buy our product. Their sales went up 30% because people looked at it and went, we, you know, we want business to be more responsible, and it's being driven firstly by technology, and secondly by a very unique generation uh, of young people. I mean, I think, you know, what's interesting about, about the book is um, I did an interview with a 24-year-old journalist in, in, in America who said, David, I like the book, but it's really obvious. And I said, it, it is to your generation, but I go and talk to, you know, boardrooms full of yeah, I do the same. year old yeah. white yeah. Anglo-Saxon yeah. males who yeah. think I'm some radical communist tree-hugging hippie. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, the, and there's a big divide, but you know, this, this generation of young people really is unique. You know, they're the most knowledgeable because of technology, they're the most socially responsible because they see all the problems in the world, but I think the, the really critical thing is that they're the most powerful because they are the people who understand more about digital and social media and how to use them than anybody. But do these guys want to work with these big, big businesses then? I mean, I think this is the fundamental point, is, you know, not only will they not work 
for companies who don't behave in the right way. They won't buy products from companies who don't behave in the right way. And you only have to see, look at, you know, Goldman Sachs employee resigns, writes a letter about why he's yes. resigning. It goes around the world in 24 hours, $2 billion off Goldman Sachs market cap. So the point is, and I think the good thing is, that what I'm seeing is from some of the biggest businesses in the world, that they really understand that actually if we want to succeed in the future, the new price of doing well is doing good. And if you don't set out to do good, you know, the world of, we used to say you either made money or you, you, did, you did good. And I think last century, um, you know, the NGOs and uh, charities had brilliant intentions, but not necessarily always brilliant execution. <laughs> Business had brilliant execution, and certainly towards the latter part, not necessarily was brilliant intentions. Yes. And what we need is both. We need brilliant execution and brilliant intentions. And I think business can be a massive part of the solution. But is it wishful thinking or is it something you're already seeing happening? I mean, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing it happen more and more. I mean, when you have the global CEO of a company like Unilever who stands up and says, we are going to double our revenue and halve our carbon footprint, you know, what you're seeing is, I sort of talk about the three ages of social responsibility yeah. in business. There's the, age, the age of image, for which BP were the absolute poster child, you know, change their logo to a little flower, the flower yeah. pretend that, you know, sit at the top of all the rankings on the most sustainable business. Now, it's not a criticism of the oil business. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we need oil, unfortunately, and we haven't worked out how to not be dependent on it. But if you're in that business, you don't pretend that you're one of the nicest companies in the world, because you can't be. Yeah. Um, then we had what I call the age of advantage, where businesses like you know, the, the Patagonias, the Marks and Spencers in the UK, the Unilevers, think they can actually get competitive advantage from being genuinely um, you know, more socially responsible. And now we're heading headlong into the age of damage, where you know, if you behave in the wrong way, you'll get taken down. So as a CEO, I'm sure there's a lot of CEOs here in the room, and they will watch the video as well. What, what would be your advice as a, as a CEO to these other CEOs that are not moved there yet? I mean, I think, you know, for me, the new rules of, of business are exactly the same as the rules of social media. It's all about transparency, authenticity, and speed. Uh, so if something bad happens, you know, you know, I think people today, they don't expect you to be perfect. They do expect you to be honest. Yes. And I think you see every time something, you know, look at in this city, Galliano, uh, a couple of years ago, yeah, racist yeah, outburst, yeah. you know, Instantly, the, the CEO of, of Christian Dior, Sidney Toledano, came straight out and said, look, we do not tolerate behavior like that in our company. He is fired. And within 24 hours, you know, it was clear that this wasn't the way Dior behaved. He could have sat there and gone, well, you know, he's very important and lots of people know him and he's famous and it, we might lose business if we fire him. And that would have, have caused problems. And you know, look at Romney in the US around tax. You know, instead of coming straight out and telling people how much tax he paid, he ran away from it for two weeks. And I think you, you have, you know, the other thing is stuff that you think might disappear suddenly becomes yeah, massive. massive news. I mean, the Domino's Pizza example where they yes. posted themselves on YouTube doing horrible stuff to pizza. Domino's thought it would go away because the old rule used to be don't engage because you'll make it worse. The new rule is you've got about one minute before you're on the news. Yeah, but don't you think it also creates the opposite problem? There's a mob mentality. I mean, in one minute, sometimes you cannot fact check if something is actually happening or not. Yes, but I think what you have to look at, and I've sort of been watching this whole area closely for about four or five years, I can find virtually no example where the crowd was wrong. It's true. So if you the wisdom at, of the crowd. If yes. you look at who they go after, you know, 99% of the time, the company that gets a kicking deserved it, or the leader that has a problem deserved it. And so, you know, if, if you could... Has it happened to you? Um, <laughs> No, I've, I've, kind of, I've done it, I've actually self-imploded more. So I was getting on the Eurostar a few months ago before the Olympics and there were huge queues. And so I, I tweeted, um, you know, terrible disorganization at the Eurostar. And that afternoon, the CEO of one of my companies in the UK forwarded an email from the Eurostar client, because they're a client of us in the UK, <laughs> saying, um, you could have a word with David about not doing things like this. And, and I believe it's not the first time. So yeah, I mean, I mean we're living in this world of radical transparency. See, yeah. you know, I mean, you only got to look at the, the head of the CIA and, the, and being caught recently up to not very good things. But there's 30,000 emails in that whole exchange. I mean, you know, not only is this radical transparency about how people can know what you're doing and create movements in social media, it's about this sort of digital footprint or fingerprint that is there. You know, the whole Deep news, behind. news limited, news of the world scandal, they've got emails and emails and emails, and that's how they're finding out what's going on. In the old world, someone burnt the files 
and it was done. So all that is fine, but you're still an advertiser. How does advertising fit into that story of business being good? I mean, I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, people, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to give the impression I'm anti-business or anti-capitalist. I mean, I think... <laughs> you're certainly if, not. If, if you... <laughs> if you What's going on in the world is on the one level we've seen the global financial meltdown because of irresponsible leadership from businesses, particularly in the banking sector, and yeah. from government leaders who ran up these massive debts and deficits. Um, so you've got that going on the other hand. On the other hand, we've got massive problems around the world because there's no growth. So, you know, there's 50% unemployment amongst young people in Spain. And so what that's... Well, I'm Greek. What, Trust yeah, me, yeah. Exactly. So you know exactly what's going on. <laughs> so what that's saying is actually what we need is we need responsible behavior and we need growth. Yeah. So, you know, and business, you know, creating employment for people is a fantastic thing. And, and, and it's a great thing. And people want jobs. In fact, the sad things coming back from all the research in Spain, it's, it's actually not the young people saying they want jobs. They're saying, we wish our parents had jobs. Um, you know, which is kind of even more tragic. Tragic. But yeah. but so I think you know, what you know what business can do is set out to say right if we behave in the right way if we do the right thing. I mean, business isn't a bad thing. You just have to make your money in the right way and go about it in a different way. And and the advertising and communications industry, you know, if it if it changes and reinvents itself, can play a very key role in that. You mentioned the word youth almost three or four times already. So what is the role of the youth for you? I mean, I think they're the biggest driver in this whole movement. And um, we created, or I created four years ago, uh, an ONG, a charity called One Young World, uh, an NGO as we call it. NGO, so I'm, yeah, I'm, in I'm English, yeah. French. <laughs> um, and, and the whole idea was how do we give the brilliant young people of the world a platform to affect positive change? And what we said is, you know, we're going to be going out to our clients saying, people want to know what you stand for beyond profit. What's your purpose? And so we thought we'd better, you know, be able to answer that question for ourselves. So what we basically do is we bring together 1,300 young people uh, from 183 countries around the world this year, so only the Olympic Games gets more. The councillors are people like Bill Clinton, Kofi Annan, Kofi Annan, Mohammed Yunus, Bob Geldof, Jamie Oliver we had this year, Jack Dorsey was there, Pete Cashmore from Mashable, you know, Jimmy Wells from Wikipedia, Ariana Huffington were also counselors. So some amazing people who, who give up their time to inspire and encourage these young people. And we so far have 500 tangible projects that have come out of, uh, of one Can you give worlds. us an example of a project? Uh, you have, for example, the Haitian School Bag Project, which is all about um, getting basic schooling equipment into the hands of kids who were in post-earthquake Haiti. Yep. This year, we launched with Mohamed Yunus the uh, One Young World Social Business Fund, and one of the, the winners of one of the grants was a business called Sort, S-A-U-G-H-T, and it's three girls in, in Asia who have created a business that makes jewelry out of uh, arms, so out of disused landmines, out of guns, etc., and sells them, and the money goes back to the charities to help people who've been injured. Um, we had Parker who became the youngest, he was our first ever One Young World Explorer. He takes climate samples on his journeys. He became the youngest person in history, age 15, sorry, 16, to ski to the geographic North Pole. He went back again last year. He's heading off to the South Pole this year. Uh, one other example, you know, they created the Missing Millennium Development Goal, saying that one of the biggest problems in the world is war carried out in the name of religion. That's preventing the MDGs being achieved, but no one's working on interfaith dialogue. So Archbishop Desmond Tutu led that, and they went and presented it at the opening morning. The brilliant One Young World ambassadors of uh, the uh, Millennium Development Goal meeting that Ban Ki-moon was hosting. And do you think that movement is actually has something to do with the rise of these consumer technologies? I mean, is, is it something, is, is that NGO you created, would it have been possible 10 years ago? Or is it something that happened because of the rise of, consumer, of social media and all the consumer technologies. I mean, I think it would have been possible, but I think the thing, you know, it, its impact would have been a lot less because our point is we just we create a platform. It's the young people who decide what they talk about, what they're going to go and do. And the whole idea is it's not just an event, but it, it's an event which is part of a movement, and the movement is open source. So there's, you know, I, I probably only know about 10 to 20 percent of what is actually being done by the One Young World ambassadors, and every time I meet them, I learn new things. And because it's an open source platform, they do what they want with it. You know, they've created, it lives on Facebook, they've created One Young World subgroups around the world, they do meetings, they do stuff, and uh, they're setting out to change the world. And I think, you know, in the global research we did, 80% of them roughly believe they can change the world, 
and 80% of them believe they have an obligation to change the world. And, I'm, and my view is, you know, where my generation got it wrong, I think these guys won't. Yeah, plus, I mean, we, I, I tend to believe we have reached, uh, you know, the first billion. I mean, all of us in the Western world are connected, more, more, more or less. I mean, it's time to reach uh, the second, the, the two other billion. I mean, these people who are 12 to 17, they're reaching uh, technology. They don't have it yet, and it's the opportunity to break a cycle. It's to empower them. So basically, what you write in your book about businesses, how you can actually empower, but they are forced. You mentioned, because you mentioned the term, they're forced to change. Whereas youth has this time the opportunity to change for themselves and, and for their countries. So how, how much uh, of these projects are uh, dedicated, um, are circulated around technology? Are they only about technology? Could it be anything? No, I mean, you know, I would actually say the majority of the projects, it, it, you know, technology is the driver of them, is the enabler, enabler of them. Yeah. And just even at the most basic level, I mean, the people who did the Haitian school bag project, it was James Alcime from Haiti, it was Erin from the US, you know, the guys down in South Africa, the guys in Australia, and they were able to put this whole thing together because of technology. You know, in 20, 30 years ago, that would never have been possible. So basically, I mean, I love the, the, the cover. I don't know if, if the camera wants to put a little zoom on that, because it actually reminds me of Mad Men, the TV show. So we see the advertising world has changed a lot. It's changing. I mean, I think that's the point. When I it, see you, it, it has. In, in, in the book, you know, to write the famous story of the Mad Men episode where they're going to advertise Lucky Strike cigarettes. Lucky Strike cigarettes, yeah. And they basically come up with a slogan, which is, they're toasted. Now, I think probably the last thing any of us would think about for a cigarette is to say, it's toasted. And I think you, you, know, you contrast that with say the Patagonia campaign, you know, don't buy this jacket or, you know, uh, Domino's and their transparency campaign, although someone said to me the other day that they're not quite as transparent as all of that. But I said, well, if, if that's the case and Domino's, you know, transparency campaign is, is nice washing, then they will get caught. And if it isn't, then good luck to them because it's been very successful. So is, this, is, that, is that change something you were able to actually steer in your own company at Havas? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're trying to change as fast as we can. I mean, I think, you know, an, an absolute, you know, so clearly we're a big global organization, 16,000 people, and we, we cannot move as fast as a brilliant small stack tech startup. Obviously. Um, but, you know, we do a thing called Have Us Meaningful Brands, which is looking at the brands that people would, would, wouldn't care about if they disappeared. You know, two-thirds of brands in the world, people wouldn't care if they disappeared tomorrow. That's a big issue for the, the business and marketing and branding world. You know, I talked about One Young World. You know, we did the Tick, Tick, Tick campaign for Kofi Annan, which mobilized 18 million people uh, behind you know, the climate issue. Okay. Um, you know, this week we did for World AIDS Day a big campaign for Durex, which was all about if you tweeted once, you know, Durex would give one condom to AIDS. So you know, we do reality drops for Al Gore. So we're using, uh, you know, we're trying to use the power of creativity to affect positive change in the world at a small level and at a big level. You know, all of our clients g are getting the fact that, you know. The world wants business to become more socially responsible. If you do, you can have a very bright future. If you don't, you will have a very grim future. And so helping you know, move down that path. A lot of clients are saying, hey, we're doing this, but should we tell people about it? How do we tell people about it? Or we understand we need to be more socially responsible as a business. We don't know where to start. So you know, we're playing quite a role in, in trying to be a, an actor in that movement. Well, on that, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, David. Merci beaucoup. It's great that you came. You're flying, Thank you for flying back to me. New York now, I guess. I am. Merci All right. 2.05 p.m. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, have a safe flight. Thank you, Paul.